Hello and welcome to the Film Pulse Podcast. This is episode number 362. My name is Adam Patterson. With me today, we got Kevin Rakestraw. Hey, Kevin. Hey. Hi. How are you doing? You know, yeah. Keeping it real? I have no idea how to answer that question. You know what I mean? I think it's just now. Absolutely. I know what you mean. This week on the show, we'll be taking a look at Tyresha Poe's selling the spades we'll also be going over what we've been watching on the watch list and new releases on vod and blu-ray thank you so much for joining us this week please remember to review us on itunes if you get a moment that'd be super helpful uh, there will be a new ryan watches a movie this week just an fyi the new episode of saved by the 90s should be dropping this week as well i'm not quite done with the edit on that one yet but i'm hoping to have it out this week i apologize for releasing Last week's Ryan watches a movie a day late, but I literally forgot that it was Thursday. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's how it, that's happened. just how it is. Like I realized it. I realized it at like 10 o'clock on Thursday night. And I'm like, Oh shit. I didn't even edit it. Like I didn't even have the edit done. So I was like, okay, well I guess that's coming out a day late. <laughs> oh, Unbelievable. that's just the world we live in now. Like, yeah, every, every day is the everyone- same. Everyone's behaving like me now. It's it's insane. It's it's just crazy times, crazy times. Let's talk about some Sella in the Spades. I have a synopsis here. Paloma, the new girl at an esteemed prep school, is drawn into the daily aggressions of warring senior class factions. She joins the Spades and becomes friends with the Spades leader, an enigmatic and scheming cheerleader named Sella. As I mentioned, this is written and directed by Tyresha Poe. This is now available on Amazon Prime. So if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can watch this for free. It's included in your membership. Kevin, I think we'll get started with you. What were your initial thoughts on Selling the Spades? Uh, Selling the Spades is like uh, a lot of movies where there's a decent amount in it that I appreciate and I can point to and be like, that is a good aspect of this movie. But with that being said, like the overall experience of it and like the just it, just the storyline really just doesn't really do much for me. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like the filmmaking and the performances, I think are, are good and enough for me as like a debut to keep an eye on to see what Poe does down the road. But in terms of like the storyline, the narrative that's that's here. I mean, there's, there's, it's intriguing from the outset. I like this idea of five factions running this like boarding school and each one, you know, they're all introduced. They get their little introduction and what they, what they handle business wise in this boarding school. So I enjoyed the setup, but like the actual, like what transpires, transpires from that point on just, I I wasn't feeling it. You know, it wasn't, wasn't in my lane. No, I agree. I I feel like this is a story that may have worked better as a, a TV, a TV series. I think that you, you look at what Tyresha Poe's done here and she's done a really great job of world building in this. I, I, I I agree with you. I liked the idea of the five factions and how they sort of secretly run things. And each faction has their own specialty. Like for instance, the spades, they were the ones who ran the drug trade in the school. I liked that and how each one had their own, you know, thing that they did. They were sort of themed like the spades were like the cheerleaders. And then you had the bobbies who were like the art, the, the, uh, the drama kids, and I I thought that that was really cool. And I was reading a little bit about the the inspiration behind this movie and stuff. And she said that she didn't really know how to write a script or anything. So she sort of just wrote them out as short stories. And there were, she wrote a whole bunch of short stories involving different people and situations and conflicts at this school. So mm-hmm. presumably she wrote a whole bunch of different, you know, plots that revolve around this school. And I was just thinking, man, this probably would have worked really well as a, as a TV series where you could have like each episode 
focus on a different faction because I thought that that was one thing that this was lacking a little bit. You know, they talk so much about the five factions, yet you only get to really see the spades and the bobbies and then the other factions pretty much take a back seat. Yeah, which is which I'm glad that you pointed that out because that was one of the things that like it is really, really great world building. But at the same time, you know, the some of these other factions like they like they're introduced at the beginning and then they're kind of like never really talked about where and to the point where I'm like halfway through the movie I was kind of like what are the five factions again <laughs> yeah yeah I I don't I, I either forgot or didn't know like what each of them did like because some of them because you know the spades make sense like they they're the ones who are like the drug dealers in the school and they that's how they make yeah. their money and then I'm thinking about like the Bobbies, like I guess they make money through doing these shows and stuff, like putting on these plays. But then I was thinking like if these are like school events, like how are they are they making money? I mean, are the spades the only faction that like actually earn a living with like I don't I'm not sure there's a there's a lot of questions I had around this. Yeah. Which I but I do think that I pretty sure that they were answered at the beginning because it was it i think it was during the introduction it was not only like hey this is this is what they handle but this is what they do in terms of the school too yeah yeah um yeah because i forget the one that i think it's the prefects or whatever like kind of keep the headmaster at bay or whatever yeah they're the ones who like wheel and deal with like the school administration and stuff yeah. yeah, they all they all have a purpose. They all they all do their own thing. But I felt like it was just I was kind of hoping for more because the only time you really see the other factions is is during like the kind of meetings that they that they have where they bring them all mm-hmm. together. And they allude. It's also interesting. And this goes along to with the world building. They they talk about this, you know, event that happened several years prior that I guess caused this giant rift between all the factions and at one time it seemed like they were like at war with one another but then they signed this truce after this like this event occurred and i was kind of hoping that maybe something like that would happen in this movie where we would see more of the factions and like what does that look like like what because at the end of the day these are like 17 year old kids you know and so it's like (laughs) Who drafted up the treaty? Yeah, when they're when they're at war, what does that look like? Like, what kind of yeah, what kind of craziness is happening there? Because is it like physical violence? I mean, or are they like sabotaging I mean, each other? On, based on what you see, sell it do. I think there's, there's a good bet there's just some violence. Oh because yeah, because she pretty much runs this like you know the head of like a like the mafia. Mm-hmm. I mean, she needs business. Yeah, one of the things that I found a little bit refreshing with this movie is that she's not an inherently likable character. I and I and, no. and she's not designed to be necessarily a, a likable character. She's it, it's sort of presented like almost like a gangster movie where she is obsessed with power and she's willing yeah. to do anything to retain that power and she's willing to crush anyone even those closest to her if she feels that they're threatening her power. And I actually found that to be a bit refreshing where she's not a super sympathetic character. No. And I think the, um, Lovie Simone who plays Sela, I think she, to me, she was the, the, the biggest, you know, like quote unquote bright spot in this movie, like her performance. I mean, if you don't have that performance there, this movie just kind of falls apart. I thought that she was quite good too, and I th- I think she's a newcomer, right? I think this is her. I think so, but I mean, it's uh, you get the sense that she's been doing this for a while. Yeah, she was quite I good. Mean, she has a couple of credits. She was quite good. Um, I mean, especially comparing her performance to some of the other ones. I'm not going to name names, but I think there were a few really rough performances in this, um, especially uh, acting opposite her. Uh, considering she was she was so good in it, but yeah. I felt like there was one specific performance that uh, 
felt really rough around the edges to me. It wasn't one of the main characters or anything, but it's sort of framed like your pretty standard high school movie. They bring in Celeste O'Connor as Paloma, and she's sort of the she's the new kid. So she's sort of the object that allows us, the audience, to learn how all of this works within this school because she's learning how it all works too. So not only is she sort of that object to to introduce us to this world, but she's also sort of the replacement from for someone else who caused this big thing that happened a few years prior. And she she's also sort of the one that, that kind of causes a rift in, in between the factions and acts as sort of a catalyst for what happens in the movie. Uh, she did a really good job too. I, I don't, I felt like maybe they could ease. I, I don't know. It, it seemed like, and maybe, maybe there was more time that passed than what I realized, but it seemed like she sort of ingratiated herself into this group, like way, like really fast. Like one second, she was this kind of timid new kid who was, didn't really talk to many people in the next second. She's like, one of the top people in the spades. She's kind of, yeah, she's kind of running. Which I think that, that was uh, when she first kind of gets introduced to what the spades do and that kind of like montage of, you know, their whole drug trade and how it operates. That's when the movie for me was like really clicking. Mm-hmm. There's a, a couple scenes like that where everything just kind of comes together and everything just like clicks and is really you know, humming along. And then some of the stuff in between is a little, little rough around the edges. It's not, it's not a complete loss. I mean, there's, like I said, there's moments here where, you know, you got, you've got something, you've got something. Oh yeah. You know, performances, music, the editing, the cinematography, everything's just clicking together. Mm-hmm. And then there's other times where it's just, it's just not working. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, when this, uh, so when I first started watching this within like the first 15, 20 minutes, I was just really not on board with it. I was just not feeling it. Uh, but then it slowly, it did slowly start to win me over. Uh, and l- as you mentioned, I think that a lot of the a- aspects, a lot of the elements uh, really do work in its favor. The the cinematography, the editing, they they're I think she uses some really creative choices in the editing and cinematography that I think make it work on this uh, sort of fantastical level. It almost feels like it's, it's not a super, the way that it's shot feels much more like we're watching some sort of like Shakespearean tragedy or something rather than this, yeah, yeah. this, this movie that's supposed to be like grounded in reality. Like it has this, this sort of fantasy vibe to it. And I appreciated that, but I think the final act uh, puttered out a little bit for me as well. Um, like the party yeah. that they had and stuff, and 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 the the climax I thought was just a little underwhelming. But I think, like you said, knowing that there's a bunch of short stories that went into like the preparation of making this, it, to me, it ultimately feels like I like this world. I like the world building. I like the characters. Performances are good. Cinematography is good. Music is good. It's just this particular storyline that we ended up on just it didn't work for me. Maybe there was other storylines that would work a lot better for me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that there probably probably are, and I'd like to see more. But, like I, I really would like to see more because I like the location. I thought that the school looked very cool. I read that this was shot in this. It was an actual school in Massachusetts that they shot it in. The movie takes place in Pennsylvania, but um, it was it was an actual like prep school that was, I think, formerly a shoot. I can't remember. It was like three different things before it was converted into a school. It was like a rich a rich person's home at one point. That's about right. Yeah, I, I liked I liked the school, the look of the school. I thought that all that was was quite good. All the production design I thought was was pretty solid too. Yeah, and getting back to the the, the Sellers character not really being necessarily likable, um, I appreciate where where they took or where she took that character. Sometimes, you know, you have this as a boarding school, it's a high school, 
and there's a little bit of melodrama, you know, them being teenagers and everything. But there's a couple of moments where it, it like it does like a sharp turn into where she comes off like like a well established leader of a gang or you know like a mafia family. Like you kind of forget that she's what like 17 in this movie. <laughs> like shit gets serious sometimes. Which I kept, which is something that I kept wondering. Like, she's 17. She's a senior in high school. Like, why is she even bothering? Like when I was a senior, I was so checked out. Yeah. <laughs> like I was just done. <laughs> like, well, I think, and I think that's the, the the thing that's different for like me and you. Like we're we're not from the boarding school background. Like I don't like our parents had some expectations for us, but like my parents didn't care if I went to college. You know, they weren't hounding me. They didn't even care if I did homework. You know, there wasn't that like insane pressure that's put on like these kids, you know, like the rich families and everything. It's, so it's, it's completely different to like, you know, me and you, it's just like, let's go to Hollywood video today. Fun yeah. school. <laughs> well, I, I, I yeah. Understand. Just do more of that guys. Your life is so much easier. Yeah. And I, I think that to, to go along with that and the sort of elevated expectations uh, of the, the, you know, fa- the parents of the kids in the school, it is a boarding school. So there are when you, I think, again, I've never been to, I didn't attend boarding school, but I have to imagine that when you, when you're at a boarding school, it, your whole life is in that school. Like your whole universe is yeah. isolated to that school and the campus and the people. Like I'm just thinking about when we were in high school and how, when you're in high school, like that's your, your world. You know, when we look back at our time in high school, we look at the, the conflicts and the things that, that happened and everything seems so trivial, but that's your entire life. That's your world. You know, when yeah. you're, when you're in that situation and I'm sure it's the same thing for people in prison, you know, everything seems so trivial if, from the outside looking in. But when you're when you're in there, that's like that's that's everything. That's everything. So I guess yeah. I guess I can sort of um, understand where these kids were coming from to a certain extent. Yeah, man. I mean, then they kind of created their own little universe to kind of keep them, I guess, entertained, occupied. Yeah, I kind of wish I kind of wish our school <laughs> kind of <got laughs> did, <out> that. <laughs> did that. Did that? Like the factions and stuff. I'd probably make things a lot more interesting. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I <laughs> I think that there is definitely there's definitely something here. I will certainly be keeping an eye out on uh, this director and anxious to to see what she has coming out in the future. And again, I'll say like, man, th- this is an a- this is an Amazon. You know, Amazon picked this up. I think they could easily, easily convert this into a, a into a show. I mean, if you look at like uh, Dear White People, for instance, like they mm-hmm. they converted that into yeah. a show, and I feel like they could do that just as probably more easily here, oh, yeah. and make it more interesting than what they did with that show. Yeah, easily. Uh, any final thoughts on Cella and the Spades? I pretty much agree with everything you said. The only thing that I would add to it is that. Uh, in terms of like 2020 movies, um, it's pretty much, I'm glad that I watched it in terms of Lovey Simone's performance. I think this is so far, I mean, we're only four months in and there's not a whole lot of movies out there, but to me, it's probably one of the best performances of the year so far. There you have, there you have it. Let's give this thing a score. Kevin, what are you going to give selling the spades? I'm gonna, I would say like a six, six and a half, maybe. I'm sitting at a six on this one. Again, that's on Amazon Prime, so you can give it a look on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. All right, let's take a look at what some of what we're watching. Uh, I have n- I have no idea whose turn it is. Is it your turn? I don't even, I don't even know. You go. You go. Okay. You go. I saw a few things this week. One that took up the most of m- the most time was uh, this documentary series called time warp the greatest cult films of all time the first volume of this comes out this week i believe on the 21st 
and it's a three-part documentary series. Uh, I watched all three of them. So it was like over just over five hours. And uh, basically this just goes through a list of what this director deems to be the greatest cult films of all time. And, and that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> like uh, there's, there's not a lot of like discussion around the sort of overarching themes of what makes a cult film. They basically look at it like movie by movie. So they'll just, they'll announce a movie and then they'll talk about it and they'll talk about why it's considered a cult classic but I, one of the big problems I had with this series was that I felt like they needed to l- talk about some broader topics other than just each individual movie, you know, tie them into some larger themes. They, yeah. tr- they try. Yeah. So like they, so the three volumes, like the first volume is called Midnight Madness. The second volume is horror and sci-fi. The third volume is comedy and camp. Now, the first volume, Midnight Madness, you would think that it's going to be talking about midnight movies, but a lot of the movies that they discuss are not midnight movies at all. Like, they talk about This is Spinal Tap, they talk about The Big Lebowski, they talk about Rocky Horror Picture Show, which was a midnight movie, of course, and some other ones, and the the, so the first volume doesn't really, it feels like they really kind of were stretching the whole Midnight Madness thing. Um, Now... Also, like on a technical level, this documentary is absolute garbage. Like it, the title card, like like the title cards and stuff, um, the lower thirds that, you know, announce like they'll, they'll have these lower thirds that come up that show like the person who's talking in the interview or the clip from the movie. So like they play a clip from Big Lebowski, for instance, and it'll say, you know, Big Lebowski and have the date and all that stuff. But there was like one time that I noticed that they didn't remove the the title from one scene to the next. So it's a, it's a movie, it's a clip playing and the title card is not the movie that's on display. Oh my God. So there's lots of like little errors. The music is all sort of just this generic royalty free music, all the transitions and titles feel like they're kind of just stock like Adobe Premiere, you know, built in things. So it all looks very bad. Um, And this is a subject, there's movies already out there. There's other documentaries that talk about cult films and midnight movies. There's, there's more specific ones. You know, this one is sort of just a general, like these are the, these are what we are saying are the best. And there's ones that, you know, talk about exploitation films from the Philippines and like, yeah. There's there's uh I can't remember the name of it. There's a whole documentary about the midnight movie and the rise of the midnight movie and all of that. Now, one thing that this movie does have is a ridiculous number of subjects interviewed. I mean, just I would say just look at their IMDb to go through all of them because there's so many. Pretty much everybody you can imagine. So what they do is when they talk about a movie they pretty much got most of the cast and crew from each movie to take part. So they got like, again, just big Lebowski. They got Jeff Bridges. And when they were talking about spinal tap, they got Fran Drescher and Michael McKean, the, the hosts. So the way that it's kind of structured very loosely is that there's, they have four hosts. So they have, and they're all in a room together. They sort of have a little conversation about the movie. And then, they jump to like the clips and have the other interviews about the movie. So the, the hosts are Kevin Pollack, uh, Joe Dante, Elena Douglas, and um, John Waters. It's a weird, it's a weird mix mm-hmm. there, <laughs> but they're all great people. And I think may, maybe I could have used a little bit more conversation between the four of them in it. And it also felt just kind of weird. I, I don't know. It's, um, it's a sloppy documentary, but it's still pretty entertaining. So that's called Time Warp, the greatest cult films of all time. The first volume comes out Tuesday, and then the other two will follow. I think like I think they're spread out like a week apart from each other or something like that. The other thing that I'll mention is that this is really weird. At the end of the second volume, so like they have like a little preview of what movies are coming up in the next volume, right? So 
in the end of the second volume, it was like, here's what, here's what you can look forward to in volume three. And it was all the same movies from volume one. So, so like they put the wrong movies in at the end for the next volume. Love it. Yeah. Absolutely love it. I'll have a review for this up on the site by the time you're listening to this. It just, it kind of sounds like it's someone made or turned a letterbox list into a movie, into a documentary Mm -hmm. in the style of like, I love the eighties. Pretty much. VH1. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I, I, in my review, in my review, I said it felt like it was just a felt like a longer YouTube essay, like a video essay. Yeah. Again, again, props to them for getting the the names that they got. I mean, yeah, it's really impressive. The, the people that they got I to do. participate. I don't wonder how they feel watching it, though. Like the you know the bigger name people, <laughs> they would be like, "What this? This is this is what? Yeah, this is I what mean, it turned out to be." Something tells me that most of them are not going to be watching it. To be <laughs> no, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the paycheck. They got it. Oh, uh, I watched Tiger Tail. Oh yeah, Alan Yang's Tiger Tail from from Netflix. There. How was this? And this was. Eh, mm. This is kind of a mess it's got a really really complex interesting story um you know this guy in taiwan and it kind of this is but this is the problem that i have with it it kind of becomes a mess in terms of the flashbacks right so you have the the taiwanese guy played by Steve ma from uh what was the show that he was always on with alan yang, the alan yang show god damn it I thought I would. I had it, and now I can't remember it. The show. The show. Um, Master of None. Oh, yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's him in present day, right? And his 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 mother just passed away. He's just just come back from Taiwan, and he doesn't really talk at all. His daughters like give him a ride home, and it's just a lot of like the the present day. It's just him alone in his house because he lives by himself because everyone left him. And he's just just kind of doing nothing. And he either like stares off there, you know, out the window or he's sitting down having a cup of tea, just staring straight ahead or he's staring straight ahead after he's doing dishes. And in those times, it's when it's like, do, 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 flashback time. And it goes back to either when he first came to America, you know, as like a 20 year old something. Or just before them, when he was in Taiwan, which is he was in love with this woman, absolutely adored her. They had a great relationship. But he wanted to get his mom out of this factory job and bring her to America. And the only way that he could do that is to essentially marry uh, the, the guy that runs the factory, marry that guy's daughter. And then that guy would pay for them to go to America and everything. And he just decides, like, okay. I want to do this because I want to get my mom out of there. Even though his mom's like, no, nah, I don't really want to do that. I don't really care. So he ends up doing that. And then, of course, it kind of tracks the way you would think it would track. You know, he tries to make it in America. The, the relationship falls apart, this and that. It's just it's just a tangled mess of flashbacks, um, which it doesn't seem to really explore like what's at at the center of his decision that kind of like just wrecks his whole life really because he doesn't know how to like interact with like his kids or anyone and he's just kind of alone but it's kind of comes down to him just being this incredibly selfish man that made a really misguided decision like I don't because the woman that he was obsessed with and she loved him too. She was well off. So he could at least just like gave it a shot. And like, hey, do you think we should get married? But no, he just in the in the cloak of night, in the cloak of darkness, just decides to run off and like, you know, never talk to her again until like decades later. But it's all it's a Netflix movie. 
Um, and like, I feel like that adequately describes it <laughs> in terms of <laughs> like style. Yeah. Like in terms of style, it's a Netflix movie. It feels very much like that. And it's just, it's, it's, it's really bland in terms of direction. You know, the style is just, I mean, almost non-existent. Mm, okay. It has it has like a, a nice complex story there, but I just I don't feel like it was explored deeply enough. Yeah, that's a bummer. I was I was somewhat interested in that. Uh, all right, that's Tiger Tail. I saw a documentary called Other Music. This is now available. This came out this week on virtual cinemas, virtual theatrical release. Uh, but it's a mm-hmm. little, it's a little cheaper than some of the other ones. I think it's a eleven ninety nine or something like that. And uh, this one's interesting because it the proceeds go to support not only local um, movie theaters but local music stores and local record labels. So you know, I uh, I'm familiar with other music. I I lived in the East Village. I moved there to New York uh, about a year no half a year like six months before other music closed so and it turned out that it was actually very close to where i I moved so i I was able to visit it before it closed and um if you're not familiar other music was a really i guess famous certainly new york famous it was like sort of this new york institution it was this really amazing record store and this documentary not only goes through the history behind the store and profiles the owners of the store and how they came to create it and how they came to open it. It was like uh, like 20 years ago. And it also follows the the last week that the store was open. And they interview tons of you know bands that got their big break through the store because this, this was the type of store where if they displayed your music... Uh, it was very likely that you were going to get noticed. So you had bands like Animal Collective and TV on the radio and Interpol and Vampire Weekend. They all got sort of their big breakthrough this music store. And uh, they, they talked to band members and other kind of celebrity figures who were, you know, into this fans of the store. And it also sort of looks at the at record store culture and what makes the record store such an important thing uh, as far as like music discovery and connecting with other people and stuff like that. And it's a, uh, it's a really, you know, it's a pretty straightforward documentary, but it's also quite good. It's, I would say, even if you're not familiar with other music, it's still worth a look, especially if you're someone who, has fond memories of visiting the record store. Yeah. Especially if you're into these bands. Oh yeah. I mean, that's why I sent you a message last night. Cause a lot of the bands that are featured in the documentary, like you and I were, were huge, you know, big fans of, especially you. Yeah. There's a lot of bands featured in here that, that you were like really into. And the, their biggest year, like the the year that they became like super famous was the like between 2000 and 2002, like in that area, like right when we were getting into these these types of bands and stuff. So uh, really good music in it, of course. Uh, lots of archival footage and stuff had me feeling very nostalgic. I wrote a review for this. You can read it on the site. It's up now. I talk about 3D CD in the review, in the review member 3D CD. Yeah. Yep. I talk, oh, wow. Yeah. I talk about that in my review because it I got me, th- heard that. it got me thinking about 3D CD and how much I loved going there. Like I just went there all the time and it was just such a great store. Man. Yeah. I can't, I actually can't wait for as soon as, as soon as the quarantines lifted, I'm going to, I'm going to hit up, I'm going to hit up a record store. This, this got me like, Itching, itching for some music. I'm gonna have to, as soon as this quarantine list, gonna have to hit up Icos. Is that still open? Yeah, well, yeah, Icos is still open. <laughs> oh my god, that's incredible. It's not as big. They mo- they moved. I think they moved one space over, and it's a lot like more cleaned up and smaller. 
where I think he bought the one next to it and the, the original one's like storage, I think. Mm, that's incredible that that place is still open. Yeah. You remember I, I would go there like every week, two times a week. Oh, yeah. God, fuck. God, I hit the record store, man. Yeah. Ico's was great. So much time spent there. Just digging in crates, man. <laughs> it was great because it's a small town. <laughs> it's, just, it's not like that we get like huge, you know, shit, you know, tons of people in, in old vinyls. Mm-hmm. But, you, you know, you would sift through all the stuff that you just sifted through like three days ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not like. It's not like you're just thinking, oh, maybe some something new came in. No, it's the same 27 records of bread. That that was the cool thing about other music was that it was like all it was like all stuff you probably never heard of. Like it was all just super rare stuff, like reissues, uh, th- things that are very very obscure, and a lot yeah. of and a lot of like up and coming artists and bands and stuff too. And the the curation there, like it is a small store, but the the level of curation they had there, I mean, was something else. Uh, the only other thing I watched is Samuel Fuller's The Crimson Kimono from 1959. Oh, a, Fuller, bit of a, a little bit of a yeah, a little bit of a Los Angeles noir going on. So this is you got Glenn Corbett is the one cop. And then his partner, James Shigeta, is his partner. So you got a white guy and a Japanese guy. Detectives partnered up in Los Angeles. And then what they're trying to do is they're trying to solve the the death of a a stripper, a burlesque dancer. And, I mean, this movie's got a hell of an opening, which is the the burlesque dancer being uh, shot down in the street, which is... The main thing about this movie, everything that's shot outside on the streets of Los Angeles, it's phenomenal, phenomenal work. It's so incredible. It just looks great. I just love the feel of it, the energy of it. Everything that kind of takes place inside, you know, like within, you know, the hotel room or backstage or, you know, in a house or whatever, like all that stuff is just kind of standard fare and, it's, you know, eh. But man, as soon as the action in this movie moves outside, oh boy, it just it, it gets kicked up a couple notches. Nice. So, yeah, it's and it's got some interesting things here because it, it deals with uh, you know they're they're back from the Korean War and they have you know you have the Japanese partner, you have the white partner, and there's some racism in there. But it's not it's not necessarily like actual substantial racism. It's just more so a feeling of like something he he thinks something's there. He keeps essentially thinking that they're thinking something and kind of projecting racism onto him. And I don't know why I said the Korean War. It's not the Korean War. I was thinking of a movie later on that Fuller did. But yeah, I would de- I I definitely check it out, especially if you're into to, you know deal with LA noir movies. Mm, mm-hmm. This is a pretty damn good one. Sam Fuller was always on sort of the the cutting edge. Like I think that a lot of the topics that he covered were way far ahead of their time. Like in that um the cult movie documentary I watched, they talked about the Naked Kiss, which was about yeah. a a prostitute who discovers that her fiance is a pedophile. And this was like from 1964. Like it's yeah. definitely something that you just wouldn't expect. Yeah, and it, like everything about the Crimson Kimono is really great, except for like the the like the solving the the murder kind of gets sidetracked by uh, the you know their clues lead them to this to this woman Chris Downs, and so they kind of like have her because she's really the only person that can kind of like give them information. So she kind of gets latched onto them and then it becomes this like love triangle thing. And then that kind of takes away, like it gets completely sidetracked and goes straight into the, you know, all the time is focused on this love triangle. And the problem that I always have with old movies is that, I mean, this movie is a little bit better than some I've seen, but there's people where there's like literally no love interest between them. And then like you just snap your finger and all of a sudden they're in love. 
Mm. It's like this huge fucking deal. Mm-hmm. Like their lives. Can, and it's just like, it, it never works for me. It's just, it always seems so ridiculous. Yeah. It, you know, it's like it, it, the Chris Downs character played by Victoria Shaw and James Chiquetta, like they're stuck in a room and they're just having like a conversation for like five minutes, maybe. And all of a sudden they're just fucking madly in love with each other. <laughs> it's like this five minute fucking conversation, man. Mm. The fuck? This is for you. I really enjoyed because of course it gets in between of their, their, their partnership. And at the very end, uh, she get a character. He's like, Hey, I'm really sorry about everything that I did. He's like, are we still partners? And Glenn Corbett's character just goes, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. That's, uh, the crimson kimono from uh, Sam Fuller. I, the last one I'll, that I'll talk about is Wendy. This is uh, Ben Zeitlin's new one. Now, if you remember, you know, Ben Zeitlin did Beast of the Southern Wild. That was my number one movie for whatever year that came out. 2012, I think. Yeah. It's like a long time ago. Long man. Time. It was a long, yeah, long time ago. This is his much anticipated follow-up, which is sort of a reimagining of Peter Pan. And, uh, you know, it, uh, when you see the trailer for it, you, you think to yourself is, yeah, that looks like a Ben Zeitlin movie for sure. And it very much, it very much is. It has that same sort of aesthetic that, uh, I really loved in Beast of the Southern Wild where it's got this kind of dirty rural look to it. You know, the, the visuals were outstanding in this. The music is outstanding he did the music in it as well, uh, just like Beast of the Southern Wild. And so I loved all the cinematography. I loved the music. Uh, the story, like the narrative itself, I thought was a bit lacking. I actually found myself getting bored a few times. So I, I got to say I was a little bit disappointed with this overall. I thought that it was okay. You know, you have a a cast that's comprised almost entirely of children. And they, they all did a pretty, pretty, pretty Here good job. Here we go. Oh, okay. They know they did a pretty good job. They did a pretty good job. I don't. I don't really have anything negative to say about the kids. Like, they were I was really hoping, and I was kind of waiting for you to just be like, "Okay, here's the thing: <laughs> these fucking kids are garbage." They weren't. They weren't amazing, but they weren't horrible. Like, like some some child actors, and and these were mostly like new newcomers too. And uh, you know, it was it was okay. I didn't. Hmm. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. Again, the the visuals in this are just out of control. So good. Uh, they shot this in the Caribbean for the most part. Some of it was shot in Louisiana, but most of it was shot in the Caribbean. And they shot it on this small island. I can't remember the name of the island. I should have looked that up. But it the island has an active volcano on it. And apparently shooting there was just really, really treacherous. It was really hard and it kind of shows like it looks like a very rugged dangerous place and i I think so i think like on a technical level the the movie is incredible i just think that the the plot is a bit lacking i mean it follows it follows the peter pan story a a little bit more closely than i sort of imagined it would uh Mm. like i I thought it was going to be just really loose like just barely anything you know maybe maybe have the same themes with you know growing Mm -hmm. up and all of that but the themes are there big time but also just like you know captain hooks in it and stuff like stuff like that no okay yeah i was thinking the super loose interpretation too I, i mean it's it's definitely loose but it's still closer than maybe it's just that i'm not a huge fan of the peter pan story that could be yeah. that that very well could be that I'm just not a fan of that story overall, but you know, I, I would give it a light recommend, especially if you're someone who really loves cinematography. Cause, and, and, and especially if you love the cinematography and beasts of the Southern wild, cause there's, there's a substantial amount of that same aesthetic in this where everything is just kind of dirty and grungy and, 
there's like you know these really powerful montages where there's people like dancing and running around and you have that kind of swelling music playing so that's that's all in here <laughs> but yeah uh this is on vod so you can give this a, a rental if you're looking if you're interested again it's wendy from ben zeitlin that's it Okay, let's talk about what we have on VOD this week. As usual, we got a number of things coming out. First up, we have Why, Why Don't You Just Die, which is a it's a Russian film. I would recommend checking this out. Arrow is actually putting this out. It's very, yeah, this is, a, this is a bit of an odd one. It's about this, uh, this guy who goes to visit his girlfriend's parents and turns out that basically he's trying to kill her dad and vice versa so like the whole movie takes place with within the confines of this relatively small apartment and it's just two people trying to kill each other the whole movie (laughs) it's quite interesting and I, i would i would recommend checking that out on the 21st we have time warp the greatest cult films of all time this is just volume one that's coming out on the 21st then we have party hard die young this is a horror movie that's actually available on shutter right now so if you have shutter you can watch it right now if you don't have shutter it'll be on vod platforms on the 21st we have himalayan ice that is a uh it's a docu is a documentary about uh these guys who are going on an ice climbing expedition in the in the himalayas i guess uh, on the twenty yeah. second, we have "Eating Up Easter," which is a documentary. That's a virtual theatrical release about Easter Island and global warming, I believe. Mm, or I should perfect. say, I should say, climate change. On the twenty second, we also have "Circus of Books." This is a Netflix documentary. I remember reading about this. This played the festivals, I think, last year, and it's about a an older couple who own a gay porn shop. Okay. Uh, on the 22nd on Netflix, we also have The Willoughbys, which is an animated film. Then on the 24th, we have Breaking for Whales. That sounds like a documentary, but I'm not sure. No, actually, it's not. Charts the unexpected journey of a dysfunctional brother and sister who are forced to come to terms with each other and themselves over their recently deceased mother's final wish. We have To the Stars, uh, One Bedroom, which is a pretty decent horror movie. We have Extraction. That's on Netflix. That's the action movie with Chris Hemsworth. Slightly interested in that. Uh, who's that directed by? Sam Hargrave. Produced by Joan Anthony Russo. Mm. Interesting. We also have Robert the Bruce, which sounds like a, ro- a biopic about Robert the Bruce, which didn't we just have one of those like a year ago? I'm maybe? pretty sure. I'm um, pretty sure we did. That was with uh, Chris Pine, right? Wasn't Chris Pine in that one? The other one? No, uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. I can't remember the name of it, but yeah. Uh, we have the uh, True History of the Kelly Gang, which is uh, about a band of rebel warriors. Looks like an outlaw. That's yeah. a curse old movie. Yeah, this, uh, this looks uh, like it might be might be good. There's there's some decent people in this. George McKay, Nicholas Holt, Charlie Hunnam, Russell Crowe. Thomas and McKenzie. Yeah, Thomas and McKenzie. Maybe, maybe I'll give that a look. Uh, that's yeah. about that's about it for VOD. Let's take a look at what we have on Blu-ray this week. We have Bad Boys for Life coming out. You know, I heard decent things about this, but I was never a fan of the Bad Boys movies to begin with, so I, I skipped it when it was when it came out yeah. in theaters. So I, I'm not sure that I'll get around to this one or not. Yeah, I probably will, considering it's one of like four movies that came out in 2020. <laughs> uh, the Gentleman comes out. That's the Guy Ritchie one. This is another one that. I kind of wanted to see, but just never got around to. Well, I think you got some time. Yeah. Fatal Attraction from 1987 is coming out on some sort of new new Blu-ray. It's a remaster limited edition. Uh, Paramount Ooh. Paramount's putting that out. Yeah, buddy. We have Itmon 4, the finale. Will it be is the it finale, that? though? Will it really <laughs> be the <laughs> finale? Is it? You don't want to paint yourself in the corner there. <laughs> I mean, can you can you believe these these Ipmon movies that they just there's so it's not really the fourth one. I'm pretty sure there were were more than that. Maybe maybe there was like 
other like ripoff ones or something that came out, but I just feel like there's always one of these Hitmon movies coming out. And they're pretty good. I mean, I saw the first two, I think. And they were pretty good. I think good. I only saw the, the first one, which was good. But yeah. at the same time, I was like, yep, that, I like that. I'm done. Yeah. I, I, don't I, need, I don't need three more of them. Right. Yeah, it seemed like it was good enough as is. But here we are. Uh, Why Don't You Just Die comes out. Uh, That's on Arrow. The Turning from earlier this year comes out. It's a horror movie. Budapest Noir comes out. That's from 2017. Huh. That's pretty much it. Mm. Yeah, kind of a light, oh, cool. kind of a light week. What about what about Criterion's this week? We got one Criterion, and it is something I consider probably like one of the best movies ever made. And that's the Cremator from 1969, the Check Me Wave film. Yeah, very nice. Very loaded, nice. loaded up with the special features. Into this is also available on the Criterion channel if you have that. All right. Thank you so much for listening. You can send us your questions and topics to podcast at filmpulse.net. You can follow us on Twitter at filmpulsenet and at filmpulsekevin. And if you have a minute, consider reviewing us on your podcast platform of choice. For Kevin Rakestraw, my name's Adam Patterson. We'll see you next week. Filmpulse.